All right, um, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, try to get through this before everybody kind of slips into the post-lunch nap. Um, so today we're going to talk about generating and compiling code at runtime with Roslyn. It's a, it's a cool new feature, a relatively cool new feature in .NET. There's a lot of really powerful things we can do with it. So I want to talk about I'll really just kind of the journey, what it is good for. Um, I have a lot of friends that are in F Sharp or uh, a lot of Kotlin people running around and they're always trying to convince you, you know, C Sharp is old, it's tired, come do this new thing. Well, this is like a cool thing that C Sharp has that a lot of other languages don't that might end up being a big deal for us. So about me, just a little bit. So I'm Jeremy Miller. Uh, been around for a while. Uh, a few of you might remember me from CodeBetter.com back in the day. Uh, but I'm the author of a couple open source language, open source tools, um, all of which up here I'm going to talk about. I'm going to bring examples, hopefully some positive examples, but definitely some negative examples of the tools that are listed there today. Uh, we're going to look at some really old structure map code. I had to go dig into SourceForge to find an example. Um, but most of you forgot SourceForge still exists, but it's still around. Uh, I'm going to pull something from Martin, which is definitely not an ORM. Okay. So there's a couple tools in specific. Uh, I'm not going to get into the specifics of the tool because I'm not trying to sell you on the tool. I'm just talking about the techniques we've used inside of this. So two closely related things, Lamar and Jasper, that are my projects. Uh, that use this technique. And then we're going to, as an example, we're going to take a look at refit and we're going to build a very minimalist uh, replacement, or well, a project using this technique to do what refit does. But we're certainly not trying to compete with refit or do it for real. Okay. So, um, a lot of you may not, in your daily lives, may not be necessarily doing anything dynamic with .NET. But even if you aren't, it's very likely you're using tools of some kind or another that are calling your code, that are doing dynamic things under the curtains. And so you're saying, oh, I hate some of this stuff, but you're probably using some of it somewhere. So JSON serializers, they're called hitting properties, setting properties on your classes. IOC containers, of course, are doing all kinds of reflective things. Messaging frameworks, ASP.NET MVC core. It's just part of our daily lives. Maybe, just maybe, you've tried to build something like this yourself, which is kind of likely if you're the kind of developer that comes to a conference like NDC London. So let's, let's jump into some of those. So let's look a little bit at just a very typical MVC controller. <clears throat> so, and we're going to use this in a later demo. So very simple, it just allows us a couple endpoints to post a new user object a new user document, which is pretty fancy. And one that will let us, let us grab it by name. But just looking at the elements here, how does ASP.NET MVC core go from our class and our code, but what it's really starting from is a request delegate. Everything has to look like a function of give me an HTTP context and then you just return a task to tell me when you're done. MVC itself is acting as an intermediary, intermediary between the HP context and calling your code. So here, you know, we've had to decorate it a little bit. We've got an attribute to tell it what the route is. This I action result that we return. This is kind of kind of help MVC core know what to do after it calls your method. The from body attribute is telling MVC core, hey, I need to serialize, deserialize the contents of the request body into this user type and push it in. There's a lot of information here. We're having to give MVC core so that MVC core knows how to use our code. Runtime, bootstrapping and runtime. Um, shame on me, I didn't do the research, but to the best of my knowledge, MVC core is building up funks with expressions and compiling, compiling lambdas to actually do the running. And we'll take a look at that. That's kind of nasty stuff. All right. So um, let's go back and take a little bit of a history lesson of the ways we've done this in .NET in the past or what your options are. 
So the easiest way to do any kind of dynamic coding is re the reflection API. It's still by far the easiest thing to use. It's approachable. Most of you probably used it. A lot of you have probably been burned in the past by using reflection to dig into an internal type or member. And who's done that? And then let's see if the same hands show up. How many of you have been burned when the underlying library changed underneath you? Yeah, me too, me too. Um, ASP.NET Core has been really terrible for that. Um, but, so reflection is very slow, it's very easy. The one thing it has an advantage on where it's still useful no matter how good this other stuff looks, reflection has the fastest slow uh, cold start time. So if you only have to do something one time in your application, Doing it with reflection is still the fastest way to do it rather than having the overhead of compiling something new just to use it once. Um, one of the cool things getting into the ASP.NET Core's built-in DI container, they're smart enough to know that, that when they're activating a singleton, they'll actually go to pure reflection instead of trying to compile a new Lambda just to be using it once. So that cold start time is really important as well. IL generation. I'm not, not sure how many people remember you can do this, but let's take a look at it because I've got a sample. Um, so this is going back. This is on SourceForge. So I'm pretty sure that this code was probably written um, maybe around 2005, 2000, maybe 2006. Um, we learned a few things there. So this is very fast. I would call it masochistic. I actually know people that claim to like doing this, but I think it's just kind of a just kind of a showy off kind of thing of ha ha ha, I'm so smart, I can code in IL. But if you look at it, it's a step, maybe a couple steps above going right down to assembly language. You have to deal with stacks. Um, it was just nasty to use. The way I pulled this off. I had an IL book open the whole time, but what you really did is you wrote the code you were trying, trying to generate, and you go use that old IL DASM code to dump out the IL that was generated from that, and you try to program to match it. And that sounds like that should be easy, but it wasn't. It was a lot of trial and error, and some of you are laughing, so you, you definitely tried to do this and it hurt. Okay? About 10 years ago, when we got .NET 3.5, we got lambdas, we got expressions, we got the ability to build up some dynamic code by using the expression API model, and then we could compile that to a strong type funk or action of some sort. And that's a lot better, but it's still weird. And let me show you an example. So this code back here. Uh, at any time, please, if, if uh, any text on the screen isn't big enough, you guys in the back will just, just sway me up. So this isn't doing very much. This is from my Martin project that is trying to make Postgres act like a document database for .NET developers, which is most definitely not an ORM. Um, all this code is doing <laughs> is creating a func that knows how to go from a model object that has an ID, and maybe you're also storing a few properties in duplicated fields, and going from that to being able to call the stored procedure that's customized for that document type. And now that I just admitted that I have written a stored procedure in the last couple years, uh, please stay with me, please still respect me. Um, but, this code's kind of wonky. I mean, it is, it is expressed in terms of code, the things that you already know how to do. There's parameters, there's method calls, there's this block thing that's just a group of them. But still, um, we've got a great community for Martin. There's a lot of other people developing on it and taking it in all kinds of ways. But this stuff is so specialized that when weird stuff comes up with it, there's only a very few handful of us that'll go and try to tackle this and make changes with this. It's not a very approachable model. Um, I would guess today that most of the IOC tools you're using, probably most of the ORMs in .NET today are probably using this technique. Um, anybody using in-service bus, I believe from, from version six on? Okay, well, if, 
I won't tell the guy. I won't tell the particular guy. It's not many hands went up. Uh, they went through a huge effort to stop trying to create so many objects and to try to dynamically generate expressions to have things kind of pre-compiled and a lot faster. And they made a huge advantage for them in terms of how much they throttled the memory, how many objects they had to create, and how fast they were. Okay. Now, some other things that adapt that frameworks do, so they can call your code. You know, we're all familiar with adapter types of some kind. Um, like messaging frameworks will usually have some kind of iHandler of T interface where imp implement this interface and your one argument is taking in T, which is your message type, and maybe some kind of context. It's just a way for you to be able to take your code and make it callable by the framework. And it doesn't have to be that bad, but it still kind of pollutes your code. You get to the point where you're not really writing code, you're writing code for a framework if you're not careful. And your application code may not be usable outside the confines of that, that framework. That's the worst possible way you can go. You can also just use lambdas, or you just say, um, thinking of examples, Sinatra-flavored web applications like Nancy FX or now Carter, where you say, for this route, run this function that takes a request, a response, and returns a task. Right? That's another way to do that. Um, the stack traces, some of the downside, the stack traces that come out of it aren't super helpful. Um, and that, that was a, a real problem for me in my structure map library that's an IOC tool. When I first moved from IL to expressions, um, I didn't pay attention to the, the stack traces at first. So anytime something blew up in structure map, you would get this massive stack trace with a bunch of junk related to all these dynamic expressions that had no bearing to any of your problems. And way deep in the middle of it might say, yeah, you had a null reference exception in a constructor. But you had to wade through a whole lot of mess to get to what mattered. And as any kind of a, a tool vendor or somebody that writes tools for other people, it turns out you really want your stack traces to be readable, legible, and to help people solve problems very quickly, or they're going to come to you with those problems. All right. So let's jump into Hello World. Uh, Roslyn's a cool thing. Uh, we can actually use the Roslyn compiler. We can actually use it in memory. We can stuff code at it, and we can build a, an assembly on the fly and load types out of it. So let's just do, do the very basic Hello World. How are we doing in the back? All right. A good speaker would have this all sorted out before they start. So I work on a tool called Lamar, and it has a core library in it called Lamar Compiler that is a thin layer on top of the Roslyn, Roslyn APIs. There's a little bit of trickery going on about creating references to assemblies and invoking the compiler. Not a lot, but this, is, this assembly generator class here is a little helper. So. What I want to do, to make this easier to call, let's say we have an interface called iGreeter that just has one method that's just going to return a string, right? So we can call up the hello world. I don't have to use the interface, but using the interface just makes it easier for us to interact and talk to the dynamically generated classes. So inside of an XUnit test, I'm going to fire up this assembly generator class. And this is going to invoke the co compiler eventually. I need to tell it, just like you would with your own .NET projects, I have to make references to the assemblies that export types that are going to be part of the generated, generated assembly. So my dynamic assembly here is going to have to have, it's going to have to have a reference to the current assembly because that's where that iGreeter interface is. Here, maybe I'm going to make this a little more clear. Okay. Now, behind the scenes, if you do this completely on your own without using Lamar compiler here, it's, uh, it's recursive. So Lamar compiler here is smart enough, when you say reference assembly, it's smart enough to add references to every assembly that this assembly refers to, 
on and so on and so on, so that you can actually compile. So um, when we say reference assembly, this assembly is an XUnit library, so it's adding references to XUnit, and everything XUnit depends on all the way down. Okay. So <clears throat> the simplest possible thing I can do, um, hard coding everything, let's just, we're gonna write this hello world class real quick, off on the fly. <clears throat> this method here is gonna generate whatever assembly right off the bat for whatever code is written. And at the bottom of it, um, now that we have an assembly object, if you've ever done any kind of custom type scanning, we can go look for all the exported public types out of it. This one should only have one, so we can go grab it, create this greeter, cast it to our iGreeter interface, and now we can finally use it. And let's give this a shot. It's just gonna run an next unit test, and it should spit out hello NDC London into the test results. Yes, no, maybe so, let's go. <coughs> No, oh, it's running. And there we go. There's Hello World. Uh, let me stop and say, if you're not familiar with the editor, this is JetBrains Writer. Uh, just in case Hottie's in the room, uh, thank you to JetBrains for my OSS license for Writer. I really appreciate it. <laughs> okay, any questions about that before I move on? Okay, well, let's go see more profound things then. Okay, so doing research for this talk the last couple days, I just kind of asked on Twitter to see who else was using this, uh, thinking that I was ahead of the curve and this was something that was new and fancy. And no, there's actually a lot of projects that already use this today. So RavenDB is using this. Uh, the refit library we're going to talk about a little bit more is using it as well. Uh, YM, that's a document generator. Uh, the Cake build engine. Script CS, well, I mean, they were really the first to do wacky things with Roslyn like this. So this is becoming more and more common. Uh, talking to some of the authors of these tools, they did hit some of the same problems I hit. Uh, this Roslyn runtime generation, it had a pretty severe problem with cold start times originally, so that first time you try to activate the compiler, when this stuff was new a couple years ago, it would take almost a four to five second hit on a high-end developer machine just to kind of warm up the compiler before it made the first compilation. It's significantly better today, but um, still be aware of that. You can feel it like when you're trying to start an application or if you're trying to run an integration test against your application, you can still feel a half second lag, or that's what I feel like when this thing is running. So inside the, the bigger Jasper framework we'll get to in a while, um, and Andy's told me he does the same thing with Raven. The compilation happens either lazily or it happens in a background thread as the application is bootstrapping. So you don't, trying to keep the user from feeling that initial cold start, start time. <coughs> All right, um, so let's get fancy, and I'm gonna admit, this is already pre-built, we're not <laughs> writing it from scratch, but let's take a look at this. Now, let me explain a little bit of what Refit does as we go along, because it, it's a cool thing that probably doesn't get enough attention. Okay, well, let actually, actually start. So, let's say, going back to the same user controller, we have a very small web API process project off this side. This is gonna be a microservice consumed by other applications inside of our system. So we've got the two endpoints, two endpoints that we care about, the create and name, and one I'm gonna use strictly just to kind of show off here, uh, just to track what our users are. So let me try to establish a baseline here. Um, I actually had this application running ahead of time. Okay. Um, let me see if I can get cocky and stop it and restart it. OK. 
Okay, let me try this again. Okay. So, right now when I start this application up, the only two users, well, just take my word for it, the only two users up here are Luke and Leia, because we're using a Star Wars theme. Now, so what refit does. This is the API we want to call. So rather than picking up HP Client Factory or HP Client and handcrafting the code to do all the JSON serialization, the JSON, the necessary JSON headers, accept headers, content headers, whatnot. Um, what if instead, and what refit does for us, what if you say you can just create an interface that is what you want the rest of your application to talk to. So we have methods for the get user and the create, and because it's an imperfect world, there's still a little bit of attribute goop. Uh, the get and post here, which I, I stole shamelessly from refit, uh, just expresses the URL pattern to the real thing, whatever the real service is. So what we would like now is to just declare this I user service and kind of step into metaprogramming, you know, like all your cool Ruby friends can do. Let, let's actually do it with .NET. Just knowing this interface and assuming we can connect to configuration to pick up the real URL, let's build a class for this on the fly, something that we can use at runtime. Is anybody here using refit for real? Okay, a few. Do you like it? Uh, we didn't use it on my uh, current project because I'd honestly forgotten all about it, and I really wish we had. Okay, let's try this. So I'll promise to write a blog post in the next couple days before, before I head back home uh, that just kind of walks through the details of how this was built. But I whipped up some code that feed in, feed in the type you want, with you do need a pre-built IOC container, and this is only gonna work with Lamar, but knowing these things, it can generate the concrete class you wanna use. So what I'm doing here, assuming this works, because it did this morning, it's gonna tell us what the source code was that it tried to generate. Let's give that a shot real quick. <coughs> and it'll come out in this window when it does. Okay. So, we, are, we have an implementation of that iUser interface. Uh, its only dependency for right now is an IHP client factory or newfangled stuff. Um, you see, see, I mean, this is code, this is generated code. It's like generated code everywhere. It's kind of ugly. Um, you know, so you see the complete full names everywhere. Um, my theory is if you are previewing the generated code to try to understand what's happening, you can just copy paste it into a real code file, reformat it with ReSharp or whatever you use and get it to be clean and pretty. But that aside, you can see the concrete steps we need to take, which is probably about what you would do if you were coding this from hand. Um, you need to build up an HP request message it's easier not to use the shorthand, post async, whatever, just so this is flexible enough to handle any kind of HTTP method. So build up the HTTP request message. Um, deal with serialization along the way. I've had this push in a couple comments just to kind of explain where this is coming from. Let me go down and see. The other method, same kind of thing. Um, this is a proof of concept, so I'm not really trying to make this fast. So if you were building this for real, you would have to do something a little more elaborate than just JSON convert dot serialize object, but just, just, just go with this for now. Mm -hmm. um, but we're generating from the signature, we're able to generate code that's gonna call the HP proxies. Okay, I'm taking just a tiny bit of look at some of the things that are going on here. So this is all exposed in the Lamar compiler library, which is, believe it or not, for anybody who has ever used any of my tools over the years, believe it or not, this is actually documented. Uh, 
Um, I'm not gonna go too far into the model, model and what it does, but let's look at a, a little bit of it. Okay. So, <clears throat> Lamar compiler, what I was really trying to do is to be able to build just really complicated methods that did some kind of unit of work. Um, handling an HP request in a web framework, handling a message inside of a service bus, are now using it here as kind of a string of operations to make an HP call through HP client and interpret the results. Uh, so the building blocks inside the Lamar compiler model, um, the idea of a frame, which is really loosely a logical operation in the code. The most common ones you're gonna use would be just either calling a method or calling a constructor and everything else is kind of weird. Um, the frames end up kind of being built in a chain model, a, a linked list, probably more than you wanna know right now. But just so you have the ability, if necessary, to wrap code around something else, like have a try catch block that wraps anything that comes on inside of it. So by building this model and how it is adapted a little bit, and like I said, I will try to promise to have a blog post that's more explanatory about this. Um, but generating the, the methods on the fly for this interface, it's code like this where we're interrogating the signature a little bit and then we just add the right frames to the method and compilation time, this thing is smart enough to know what little bits and dabs of code actually gets written in. Okay, I think that is enough on that model. Uh, but just for fun, let's actually run the whole thing. Okay, so test right here that I'm about to run. Um, set up a little bit of a container. So this is the Lamar container that is the spiritual successor uh, to structure map because I don't want to support structure map anymore and I wanted people to have a way off of it. Um, so it's very specific. The only th two things that really matter here, using the same at HTTP client, the same bootstrapping that you would use in an MVC core application today, just to add that to the service registrations, because Lamar supports the ASP.NET core DI model out of the box. And then there's a policy here that's specific to Lamar that just says, if you ask for a service that I don't know about today, um, and that service has, let me take a peek at this. And if that service is marked, has methods that are marked with these refit clone attributes, I'm gonna go ahead and make up a class on the fly that implements this interface that does what I think you want it to do. Some of you are probably saying this is too much magic, I don't like it, um, and that, that's all fair. But this is enough right here to set up the application container. So now I should be able to say, go grab me a user service, not knowing that it's being built on the fly and this is a dynamic class, but go do it. Um, I'm gonna do a sanity check to make sure it's not null. And we're gonna go post a new user called Darth Vader. Have a little, have a little family reunion. Um, so I'm actually gonna call the methods and then we're gonna try to fetch Darth Vader to prove that he's really there. Now, before we do that, let's do the, you know, nothing up your sleeve kind of thing. So I call this method refresh just to see what's here. Um, so right now, the only two users up there are Luke and Leia. And now let's run our test. Run this whole thing. And while that's running. Uh, so my younger son is going to turn five in about a week or so. And uh, I, I had a deal with his older brother years ago that he wasn't allowed to watch Star Wars the movie until he turned five. So we made it this huge deal with my younger son of you get to watch Star Wars when you turn five. So 
that's what I get to do on the weekend when I'm home from NDC. Let me make sure it's actually running. Okay, we're running. And okay, does everybody see now we have Darth Vader? Woohoo! <laughs> Yay! Or you can go use the existing refit library that does this and much, much more. But all right. Uh, actually, something that does bother me. So. There, there are so many children's books now out there with uh, Star Wars, you know, like Star Wars, Darth Vader and Son, Darth Vader and his, and his daughter, and they're, they're really cute little books, but my five-year-old, soon to be five-year-old, has read all these books for years, and he's not gonna have that, that just visceral shock during Empire Strikes Back of, oh my God, Darth Vader is Luke's father. Um, and, and I just kind of feel sorry for him. Okay. So, any questions about uh, what we just saw before I, I move on? Because I'm going to grab a drink real quick. <laughs> so, so Mark, I was uh, when I grew up. Uh, so I lived on a farm, pretty far out of town, and it was hard to go in and see movies. So, all of my cousins who lived in town got to see Return of the Jedi just like two months before me and spent that two months trying to tell me that, no, Yoda says it's true. And I just tried to fight with him the whole time. No, it's a lie. So I, I was the last child in America that year to know the truth. <laughs> so right there, I think you all know exactly how old I am then. OK. So um, now let's talk about frameworks. because so the main usage for all this technique is really writing frameworks. Um, some of you are saying, well, I really want to piece together libraries. I should be d delivering value for my client. I shouldn't be writing frameworks. But once in a while, it's going to be justified. So let's just pretend that they're not always terrible things and just, just go with it a little bit. What about a rule engine? Excuse me? What about a rule engine? Um, rules engine sounds like a great one. I don't know. Every time I've done a rules engine, it's always been event condition action. So there's always... I event, I condition, I action. Um, yeah, I suppose so. Um, but that's definitely something I'd want to take off the shelf. So, have you built a rules? No, no. I, the first thing that came up to mind. Okay. Me, I, don't much I mean, it, it's pretty common to build build a real limited rules engine that's very specific to your problem domain, and I'm, I'm not looking down on anyone for that. But um, it's also a great way to uh, waste a lot of your employer's time. Okay, so frameworks at the very best, when, it, when they're good for you, when, when they're helpful, they allow you to develop a lot faster by just taking care of repetitive work. Like when we're dealing with MVC core, you're not sitting there manually grabbing the HP context and invoking a JSON serializer to go read stuff all the time. I mean, you do once in a while for special things, but the happy path of JSON in, JSON out it's just dealing with that for you, so you don't have to worry about it, right? That's a good thing. Um, dealing with object life cycles and disposal. Like most frameworks today, whether it's a messaging framework or an HP framework, something where you're issuing commands, it's taking care of things like activating the unit of work, um, disposing it when you're done. All those things that if you did not take care of them would lead to a massive memory leak in your application. But if you're staying within the narrow, the well-lit paths, you can just let the framework handle that for you. So there's less stuff for you to worry about. Um, a good framework and a good application framework should be able to handle a lot of cross-cutting concerns. Like, can you just throw some generic, I want a unit of work transactional boundary, just do it for me. Or I want to wrap security around this. Some kind of middleware that, that's helpful to take repetitive tasks away. Um, and then as much as possible, and, and this, is, this is my opinion, and a lot of people don't agree with this, I want the framework to get out of my way completely. I don't want to see a lot of cruft in my code. I don't want to see a lot of marker interfaces, a lot of attributes that's all garbage and junk. 
Um, other people will have the attitude of, I like that because it's explicit and I know a little bit more about what's going on. Um, there's room in the world for both of us. I just wish there was more room for me. Um, frameworks at their very worst, they're going to force you to use a lot of adapter classes. So you're not doing something that validates you're writing a behavior, um, a behavior or a middleware that then calls the thing you want it to call. And eventually that kind of weight can wear you down. Um, a lot of extra, this is a .NET problem, except the Java guys are, have caught up. Uh, too many attributes in your code. You know, especially looking at some older Microsoft frameworks, and, and I'm thinking WCF or, or really anything that came out of Microsoft in the mid 2000s post Longhorn phase, where it was just so many attributes to do so very little bit of code. Um, the problem I incurred, and I'm going to show the negative example, um, way too many object allocations. By having all these adapter classes that then just call normal code, you're creating a lot more objects than you would, would if you were writing everything from scratch bespoke. That could be a problem under heavy loads. You're making the garbage collector work way harder. And you can actually see performance problems because of the GC kicking in to clean things up or just blasting through memory. And I, of course, know this because I caused this problem in my prior uh, previous employer, okay? Poor performance, just same, it's closely related, all the bad, um, too many objects, too many layers of indirection, of build this object that just calls that, that calls that, and you see where that goes. And then the absolutely just epic stack traces. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this. Uh, I've heard this attributed, attributed to a lot of different people, but you've heard the joke that Enterprise Java is a DSL, to turn huge piles of XML into massive stack traces. <laughs> Except I'm not innocent. Okay, uh, for any Generation X people out there, um, my college roommate was huge into cake. Um, and it took me 20 years to like them again. But, so with this code generation stuff, the theory here is we can have all the good stuff we want. We can keep our code really clean, uh, but we can still be fast even if we're using this really flexible middleware generation if we could just generate the, the, the kind of goop adapter code instead of creating a bunch of ton of classes. Or introducing a little bit of conventions where we can look at your code and we know how it's wanted to be called. When we looked at the iUser service, let's go back and take another peek at that. <laughs> okay, when we look at iUser service, we can look at the code, the signature of the code, and that tells us a lot about the intention of what this should really do. I'm just generate code for it. So this was a lot funnier in my head when I was telling people about this a month ago, but I still love that song, so. Okay, so years and years ago, um, I blew an extraordinary amount of energy, time, uh, <laughs> and uh, emotional attachment to a project called FUBU MVC that was an alternative web framework in about the 08, 09, 2010 timeframe. Um, the absolute highlight of NDC London for me so far uh, one of the volunteers came up to me and said they used it and they actually liked it and he would still talk to me. Um, but it's mostly forgotten for good reason. So when we did FubuBC, our big thing was trying to make this thing as flexible as possible. So we love the very early idea of, that every framework uses now, of the Russian doll model. Of, if you look at MVC Core or ASP.NET, MVC, ASP.NET Core by itself middleware, you have an outer middle, middleware that sits on the outside. Maybe that's handling security, maybe it's handling exception. A request comes in, it's able to surround everything but call into maybe a validation middleware in between, which eventually gets to your guy inside. So you think about those Russian stacking dolls. 
And every time I do this talk, there is actually a native Russian speaker who tells us how to pronounce it right, but I can't do it, so I won't try. But that was the motif we used to describe what we wanted to look like. So that, that is what ASP.NET Core middleware is today. All right? It's great, it makes a lot for us to do things like I'm going to completely ignore security for now, and at the end, I'm going to slap identity server middleware around everything, and boom, I have authentication without having to worry about it for the past three months, ideally. Okay? So, FUBU, um, FUBU MVC, did it with this idea called behaviors. This is, this is before everybody just adopted the term middleware and went with it. So middleware, uh, behavior in FubuMVC was very closely analogous to uh, ASP.NET Core middleware. Um, Implementation-wise, it's probably closer to an action filter from, from MVC, but just kind of go with it. So this, this code here um, was a transactional behavior if you're using Martin, the Martin application or the Martin library to do persistence in your application inside of a FubuMVC application, th this behavior just allowed you to do just the transaction boundary around this. So by wrapping this and whatever other behaviors are inside of it, um, down to the actual controller action, maybe some other things, so that everything that was done inside of this would be in the same unit of work in the same logical database transaction. Okay, kind of cool. Um, but what happened when this was taken way too far, where we had a transaction behavior around everything, and there's validation stuff, and there's um, update a log, write a row to the record of, hey, I was here in a couple different actions. You got to the point where there was literally about 20 different behaviors all nested inside of each other. Um, you know, one, it was really slow because every time you executed a request, this is all built up from a container of this on the outside, something on the inside, 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 inside. So you're creating a ton of objects, you're making your IOC container work really hard. And when this blew up, when it blew up in your side of your controller actions, all of that gunk on the outside got into the stack trace, and it was epic. It was, I have no business making fun of Java, enterprise Java developers for their stack traces, because this, this was just terrible. So, flash forward, and let me see if I can make some amends to the rest of the world here. Okay, so the Jasper framework, which is still heavily in flight, may never get out of in flight, but it's at least proving out, I think, this, this technique, and maybe it's something somebody else could ye look at and go write their own better thing. But looking at the past of FubuMVC as, as a failure, um, it's always a lot of, I'm fighting the last war, what are we gonna do differently this time? Well, one, I wanna be a lot faster this time. I want this thing to really perform and scream. Um, part of the way it's going to be faster, this is a big trend I've seen all over the .NET world, is this new obsession that probably a little bit healthy of minimizing the al memory allocations that happen at runtime. Um, the guys working on, or, or excuse me, the folks working on Kestrel, they've done amazing work. You've, you've all seen .NET Core places like fourth right now in the Tech Empower uh, performance shootout. Um, and then knowing that the three things above it are just barely faster and they're all experimental things. ASP.NET Core is the fastest HTTP handling thing on the planet that's actually meant to be productive and used in production apps. Did y'all know that? So it's been cool, and, but they've done it by relentlessly reducing memory allocations. So I'm gonna try to copy that, kind of, kind of go on the same thing. Um, I still like the idea of trying to keep the code that users write just as clean as possible. No, no marker interfaces, minimal attributes, no, no goop. That does mean that you're using some naming conventions, uh, which some people hate. So let's come down to the next side. That let's have some way that's really easy for users to see 
what is Jasper trying to do with my code? What is it surrounding around it so they have a way to kind of unravel what the behavior is? And my theory is by using generated C sharp to apply all your middleware and your transactional boundaries and all that good stuff, just show the user this is the generated code with the hope that anybody using this tool already understands C sharp so they can just look at the generated code. Let's <laughs> pop in. Okay. Let me switch to Jasper itself now, finally. So when an HTTP request is handled in Jasper, every unique route compiled up front, there's gonna be a route handler object for each individual route. And there's really only one method we care about here. Very close to a request delegate, uh, this segments thing is passed in just so it doesn't have to duplicate the work that the router already did to split the URL string. Um, take in the ASP.NET Core HTTP context, return a task, and do whatever you do. So very similar to the control, user controller we talked about at first. Um, I'm gonna build an equivalent in Jasper. So say we have a command that is create user. When this is posted up to our web service, I want you to go make a new user object and persist it somewhere. Okay, uh, and because I'm, because I like Martin and we already support Martin for this, um, I'm gonna assume that my backing persistent store is Martin, which behind the scenes eventually is just, just Postgres. This is the Jasper endpoint to handle the two HP endpoints here. One, to go get a user by its ID. There's a little bit of a naming convention. This is enough to get out the path slash user slash and ID as a route argument. <coughs> uh, we'll just notice a few things here. Uh, all the methods are static. They don't have to be. They can be instance methods. They can be async. They cannot be async. But in this case, um, I'm eschewing any kind of constructor injection. Uh, just like MVC core, and I, I did get the idea from them, we're just gonna let you inject services directly as, as arguments here. Makes your code a little bit simpler. Your code just becomes functions and on classes and methods, right? Up here, uh, same thing, we're taking that command. Um, Jasper's just gonna assume the first argument here that's, a, that's not a route argument. We just assume that's the, the message body so you don't have to do the from body attribute. Take in the things you need. That's the Martin I document session and the iLogger you probably use today. Um, I said try to minimize the usage of attributes but it's an imperfect world. So easiest possible way to say, I want the Martin transactional middleware applied to just that one single method is just mark it with an attribute. Okay, so this is actually completely functional, which I'm not gonna try to disprove by actually running it. Um, but let's, let's look at the generated code for this. Okay, and I have this. Let's see. So one of the things um, with Jasper, we've embraced the command line, um, which I, I, I love the .NET CLI. I, I think it's been a great model. It's been a great advance. Um, I am perfectly cool with .NET stealing good stuff from Node.js. Um, but one of the things Jasper does is it adds a couple new commands to its command line support for strictly for diagnostics. .NET run will run your application just like you're used to, but there's a few other helpful things. So this code command um, will have it start up the application, um, a lightweight startup so it doesn't start up the, the server, the Kestrel server or run any kind of background services. But do that and then show me what all the generated code for all the route handlers or message handlers. So we're just gonna take a leak, look at this and this is gonna show us a quick preview of what the generated code is. Let me try to relate this a little bit. 
So this is the generated code to get the user by its ID. So I mean, we're gonna go back and forth just a little bit. So this method right here, get user underscore ID. So writing the intermediate code to go from, I have an HP context and I want you to do the rest of it and eventually call this method on the inside. That's this code right here. So what got generated around it, starting up the query session. So knowing you have a Martin document store, uh, if you use RavenDB, this should look pretty familiar. Um, so the document store would be analogous to RavenDB's document store, not coincidentally. Um, or if you came from in Hibernate, this would be like the iSession factory. There's not really an equivalent in EF core. Um, then this, the query session here, this would be analogous to a DB context in EF core. This one, the query session, it's super lightweight. It only does read, it only exposes read things. But it does need to be cleaned up and disposed at the end to make sure you're cleaning up any database connections to Postgres. Uh, so we definitely need to do it here. It's doing it, generating it with a using statement to make sure it gets cleaned up. Inside of that, it's generating a little bit of code. It is generating code to be able to grab the route argument from the route. And this is just a string, so it doesn't have to do anything, but grab the segments, the segments array. The ID we know is on slot number one of that array, and then we execute our, our endpoint. And because this is a static, we didn't have to create any new objects, but we could have, and we pass in the service. And then down here, this is Jasper stuff. This is just writing, writing the JSON back out to the response. Looking at a little more interesting model. So the write here, let's get, let's get a little bit cocky about this. So when we write, get it to the point because we're using the transactional middleware up there, I don't have to worry about committing the session. The middleware is going to do it for me. So something else could combine into the unit of work. Um, so I can get to the point where I can write code like this, where take in the create user command. And what I'm trying to achieve is to create a new user document, persist it, and I'll log it just to show more stuff going on. Um, just to store it to the session, that's a synchronous method. So I don't need to worry about any kind of task. And that's why I can get away with a void up here. Because I don't care. So I don't have to be returning a lot of task.completed tasks to make the compiler shut up. I can write the easiest code to do what I want it to do. Let's take one quick peek, more peek at this. Let's make sure and save it. And then I'm gonna flip over to the command line and regenerate it because I changed the code. Okay. This one's a, just a tiny bit fancier. So when it generates the, this class, from the container, the Lamar container is still hanging around in there, but from the configuration of the, the Lamar container, I know that iDocumentStore is a singleton. I know that the iLogger of whatever is a singleton. And that's important here. So this request route handler, this is only created, it actually instantiated once in the entire application and then stuffed in the right place in the routing tree. So by knowing that these are singletons, I can just inject these in one time and these are completely inline for every other subsequent HTTP call. If you're using really just about any other .NET net tool like this, it's making an IOC resolution of your controller every single time. And most of the good IOC containers are, are good about inlining singletons in their generated funks, but they may not be. But what could easily be happening to you is 
there's a bunch of dictionary looks up, lookups inside the IOC container to find the right strategy of how to build it and execute it. And there's just a lot of stuff going on that happens every time at runtime. What we're trying to do with Jasper is we're trying to eliminate that as much as possible by knowing about the IOC configuration up front, knowing about what all the right life cycles are, some rules about code generation. We're trying to bake that kind of decision making that's runtime in a lot of other frameworks, trying to do that up front and compile it one time. So that, that's why we take in the document store, the logger, one time when this is created. And inside of this, the session has to be scoped to the request, and it knows that. So everybody that would want or to use a document session will get this. The frame model is smart enough that it can write the inner stuff in, in between. So there's a frame that knows, hey, you need an iDocument session. I can do that for you. I'm going to create this from the document store directly, wrap everything around the using so it all gets saved. Uh, this is just reading the JSON request, actually calling your endpoint method, and this is all this is all void, so there's no work, no async, no await. But down below, it knows this document session save changes async is definitely async. I'm going to do that. Um, another side benefit of this code generation model is assuming we do this stuff well. Uh, it should embed and encode the right to use a wait here, async. Do you actually try to, if the last call returns a task and it's the only thing that's async, we just return the task so you don't have to use the, the um, inefficient async keyword, but let the framework smarts and the code generation smarts handle more of that low level handling. So you can worry about, strictly worry a little bit more about um, what your application's really doing, which is not a whole lot. Um, and then years ago, um, Mark Rendell over there in the middle trying to stay awake, um, watched a talk of his and he talked about how he tried to be pretty strict with HTTP status codes, okay? So I did listen to one of your talks. And after an hour of listening to Mark talk with that Liverpool accent, I went home and I listened to the Beatles for the next day straight. You are from Liverpool, aren't you? <laughs> okay, you sound like Paul McCartney to me. Stupid, ugly American. Okay, so you all know that, <laughs> so you all know that they have done, there's, there's some linguistic studies that, I have a Midwestern American accent, so I'm neutral, everybody else has an accent, but People in the northeast of the US, they have been able to prove that that's what English people sounded like in the 1700s, 1600s, whenever, and y'all drifted off a different way and they stayed behind. Yes, and we got invaded by French aristocrats, and so we changed the way we thought and spelled things. And but the Americans had already gone by that point, and most of the Americans went from Plymouth, so they were all from the West Country. Okay. <laughs> so, I resent that a little bit, represent it. So, my one, the one English ancestor I know about, my grandmother's grandfather always bragged that he had a fortune back in England if he could just get back to get it. So, I may or may not, probably not, am from some kind of English aristocracy. Um, that aside, <laughs> so that aside, uh, to be a little more correct with, with HTTP status codes, because this is creating, let's override and force the status code to 201, which means created. Don't anybody correct me if that's wrong. Um, and let me see how the, the code generation changes. <laughs> Real simple. Um, MVC Core does the same thing. Um, I know I've seen this in Nancy in the past. Uh, if you're returning an integer, we assume that means to be the status code. So if we look now, there's just a little bit of code to take the result of that endpoint method and then just immediately write it to the status code. 
Okay, any questions about that? And I swear I'm about to wrap up. Okay, so conclusions here. What I think and hope is being able to do this kind of dynamic runtime generation with C Sharp code, um, or it does support VB if people still do that, um, that this is much more approachable to many more people, that you could do more elaborate things, um, or just the barrier entry to getting into this is much lower because we all know C Sharp. Um, so I'm gonna claim it's not that scary. The, if you look at the code generation code, it looks kind of messy. Um, some of that is just being able, having to order who's dependent upon what. Uh, the string interpolation, having that in C sharp, was that seven or did that come in six? Okay, that, that, that's a lifesaver. I don't know if you would even wanna to try to do this without string interpolation, but that makes a big deal. Um, but the model's just not that bad. So I'm also hoping this kind of gives us a big potential to start making the frameworks we use from here on out be a lot faster, maybe some more intention revealing code. Um, maybe this is something you could actually incorporate when you need small dynamic frameworks in your own application. And with that, I'm done. <coughs> Thank you all.